Hi, I'm Charles Hoskinson, Chief Executive Officer of Input Output Hong Kong, and this is a brief introduction to smart contracts. So, what are smart contracts and why should we care? How do we even begin to explain them? What I found is the easiest way to begin understanding the notion of a smart contract is first to kind of think about Bitcoin, to look into Bitcoin itself. Well, the Bitcoin protocol, what it really does is it enables push payments. Uh, so you have Alice and Bob, and Alice wants to push value to Bob. She would do so via a transaction. Alice's value is bound to an address, as is Bob's value. And the receiving address has absolutely no counterparty risk. So Alice is able to push value to Bob, and after 60 minutes, or six confirmations usually, uh, ownership is probabilistically uh, nearly guaranteed. And this is a beautiful, very elegant, very simple payment protocol. Most of the design focus and innovation that we've seen over the last six years in Bitcoin has focused heavily on improving transactional security as well as robustness. Uh, and so we say, okay, we have things like multi-party signatures. We have things like hierarchical wallets. We have things like cold storage solutions. And we even have specialized hardware that allows us to have a great degree of control over who we want to send funds to and the conditions behind that, in terms of uh, how many signatories are required and so forth, as well as how that value itself is going to be stored. But one of the big problems is, what if I want to broaden beyond just signatures and I want to actually attach arbitrary rules and instruction manual behind that transaction? Uh, so, for example, let's say Alice wants to push $20 worth of Bitcoin to Bob if and only if Bob mows her lawn. Well, from Bob's perspective, he has to know she has those funds. And from Alice's perspective, she has to know that's been done. You see, in, in the Bitcoin Core protocol and any uh, protocol derived from the same mechanics really doesn't have enough robustness in its design to be able to facilitate this type of a transaction. And even if it did, that's a very specialized transaction just to two parties. So this, in essence, is really the notion of a smart contract. The most effective mental model is just to basically view them as a value flow. So just like Bitcoin, where Alice is sending value to Bob or to another source, but we're instead going to attach rules to that value flow. So in general, uh, you, one cannot use that value unless those rules are satisfied. And that's really what a smart contract is. And there's two broad categories of smart contracts. There are deterministic smart contracts and non-deterministic smart contracts. Uh, the primary differentiator uh, is basically if the network has sufficient information to determine an outcome without the need of outside information. Uh, and we'll go into this in much more detail in a bit. In both cases, the overall goal of smart contracts in general is usually to take some form of centralized or federated service and decentralize that service in order to improve transparency, reduce the need for trust, and in many cases you actually gain a lot of economic efficiency because you no longer have to pay a central actor to do something. So this is in a nutshell what a smart contract is. It's just basically a value flow from one party to another with some sort of rules attached to it and you can break it down into two categories, so a deterministic case and a non-deterministic case. So let's examine the deterministic case first because it's simpler. So the Conocchio example that one usually uses for the deterministic case is the idea of a lottery. So let's go ahead and examine uh, a standard lottery, uh, a lottery without any smart contracts. So in a normal lottery, we'll have Alice and Bob and her friends. They're all going to send value and select some set of numbers to a central actor, who in turn is trusted to store those funds, and that's called custodial trust, and has to conduct a fair game, and that's called house trust. So you're trusting the actor to actually do two separate things, store the money as well as conduct a game. The central actor will run some form of random number generator, and then we'll have some form of rule to determine if there's a winner from the people who have submitted numbers. Now the big issue here is you have to trust that central actor, and there have been many, many, many cases of lotteries being fraudulent. This is typically why they're highly regulated and also why usually winners have to be identified or else how do we even know the lottery uh, uh, is actually paying people. So this is one of the uh, problems with a central lottery system. So what if we could build a lottery with deterministic smart contracts? So let's look into that. So with a deterministic smart contract, 
Alice, Bob, and her friends, they're going to send value along with chosen numbers. So this in many ways looks identical to the Bitcoin transaction address model. And the address is going to be a special address chosen specifically for a smart contract. And so they're going to send value to it. And they're going to put a bunch of rules and conditions, uh, such as the game rules, how winner validation is going to work, how long funds are going to be pooled, and other information. And then the network itself is going to execute that lottery contract and it's going to uh, use some sort of mechanism to determine randomness such as let's say the hash of a block at a predetermined height uh, so you could say at height 100,000 take the hash of that block and uh, the XOR distance to that hash whoever's closest to it will be the winner this can be an example and uh, there are many other ways to do this but this is a considered to be a very secure way in any event what we've basically done is we've created a situation where Alice, Bob, and the other people participating have now sent their value to a specialized address, not a central party. They've sent it with rules, and the network itself has sufficient information to always be able to determine a winner, and the payment to that winner is absolutely guaranteed. Now, this is a really powerful idea for some, uh, some sort of simple problem. What are our advantages? Well, first, participants can be anonymous. This is generally not the case with most lotteries because usually you'd like to know that a winner has been paid. And unless you have some sort of blockchain-based system behind it, it's very difficult to verify that. With a smart contract-based lottery, you actually can. Second, the rules and mechanics can very easily be changed just by simply changing the smart contract. And that's done in a very transparent way but then it can be done to actually add uh, third-party payers such as taxes and also to add in perhaps some regulatory compliance conditions for participants. Pools of funds can only be spent uh, the way the participants intended, so all of the custodial trust is completely removed and no central actor has to be paid. That's a humongous advantage uh, because many of these central actors uh, take fees and that adds no value to the people participating. Okay. So that's the deterministic sense, and the deterministic sense is very simple. It's just Alice and other actors will send their value either to another person or to a specialized address. They'll go ahead and attach rules to that transaction, and the network itself has sufficient means to determine uh, how that value needs to be transacted and spent. But what if the network doesn't have sufficient information? This is the non-deterministic case. So the network facilitating the smart contract doesn't have enough knowledge incumbent to itself to actually say who is a winner. Uh, and so you need some sort of outside party or trusted source. And we call that outside party typically an oracle. And these are the types of problems that come uh, usually up when you're talking about human behavior, you're talking about certain events, you're talking about predictions. Uh, so for example, if you and your friends have a drinking game and you bet some person uh, that he can't drink uh, 10 shots of some drink uh, without passing out. Well, you and your friends are witnesses to that, but how will the Bitcoin or Ethereum or other network even know that event? So this is an example of a non-deterministic smart contract. You need some sort of third-party source, a trusted source, to be able to make a value judgment of whether that event happened or some information. Another thing could be price uh, flows. So what is the value of Bitcoin in terms of US dollar? This is something the Bitcoin network actually cannot know. So these are non-deterministic problems and they require an oracle to sort out. So the conochial example is typically sports betting and because it's usually the easiest toy example to keep in the back of your mind. So I'm a big Denver Broncos fan. I love Peyton Manning. I love the Broncos. Hope they win the Super Bowl. But no matter how hard I try or what BIP I propose, I don't think anytime soon the uh, Bitcoin network will have the ability to determine if the Denver Broncos have won or lost a game or the stats of a particular Broncos player. This is just something that is outside of the network, and I have to trust a third-party source to import it. So while the participants can agree in a deterministic way about rules, terms, and conditions, as well as odds and other factors, in the non-deterministic case, you're always going to have to specify some form of an oracle to give the smart contract the information it requires for those terms and conditions and rules uh, to determine who won or how value is going to flow. So did the Broncos win or lose? I need some sort of feed to tell the smart contract that. The good news is, however, that uh, all the rules, so the odds and how people are going to be paid contingent on the victory, 
those can all be deterministically placed in similar to the lottery contract. But this does have an effect of reducing the security of the system to basically the reliability of the oracle in many sense. So what can we do about that? Well, we can carefully think and perhaps federate oracles or create an arbitration process. And this was kind of the notion of projects like Truthcoin and Augur, They're using ideas like principal component analysis, where they try to create, uh, using clever math, ways of reducing the overall trust one would have on a particular feed and increase the overall reliability of information feeds. In general, it's unfortunate but true, the most desirable applications of smart contracts, such as creating value-stable currencies, so that would be a currency that would peg itself to the, let's say, the price of the U.S. dollar or to the euro, um, or building a decentralized autonomous organization, they usually do require some degree of non-determinism. But in any event, even if the oracles are centralized, it's important to really understand that one of the godsends of smart contracts is that they will, in all cases, oracle or otherwise, remove custodial risk from capital pooling. So even though you may have to get information from a third-party source, uh, that third-party source in no way has to hold custody of the funds. And this dramatically reduces liability and does reduce a lot of, bit of, uh, a lot of fraud. And there's also, it's important to mention, there already are services that provide trusted price feeds and trusted information feeds. Uh, you don't have to look any further than Bloomberg terminals. Uh, so non-deterministic smart contracts do actually map well into legacy systems. Okay, so let's put it all together. Smart contracts are composable. And what that basically means is you can actually take fundamental units of behavior, such as a random number generation or an escrow contract or a lottery contract, and you can actually combine these things together to create highly complex behavior that is emergent from standardized components. So you know all the components behave in a certain way, and if they're put together like Lego bricks, they actually can produce something even better. And that's an incredibly desirable characteristic of any system. Second, your trust model is always uh, understandable. Uh, prior to the flow of value. And so that's a very powerful characteristic as well. Generally, when I send value to a, a third party, usually there's a lot of stuff happening behind the curtain, and I just kind of have to hope that their reputation is good, or I have to hope that regulation is good for them to behave in a certain way. Uh, but with smart contracts, one of the most powerful characteristics is generally I have some degree of control over that trust model, or at least I understand it prior to even sending a single piece of money a single flow of funds. The cost of changing rules is also very low, so there's no menu cost here. You can just simply rewrite some of the code or change some of the modules that you're using, and now you can have completely different outcomes. And custodial risk can always be taken by the network hosting the smart contracts. And that's a very powerful characteristic because now we're separating concerns and allow people to specialize and uh, have uh, much lower liability. Um, and the other wonderful thing is that none of the communication or transactional anonymity techniques that have been developed for Bitcoin uh, have to be sacrificed to use smart contracts. So you can use smart contracts in tandem with mixing services, or if zero cash was implemented, they could actually be used together. And there's many composability characteristics of that. So uh, this is an example of running an anonymous lottery or perhaps an anonymous voting system, for example, where you can actually have deterministic and predictable outcomes. However, you do not need to reveal someone's identity for that. Um, one of the downsides, unfortunately, is that oracles are needed and they do present theoretical problems as well as practical problems. And there is a lot of additional research that's going to be required to reduce those downsides. And luckily for us, the Augur and Truthcoin projects and others hopefully will come up with all kinds of cool ideas to uh, make these systems a bit more standardized and robust. So here's some helpful resources. Probably the starting point for most uh, should be Nick Sabo's paper on uh, smart contracts. Uh, this came out in 1997 and it is often considered to be the first academic work on smart contracts. Nick Sabo is considered to be the father of smart contracts. And uh, there's an HTML version of it on the Nakamoto Institute website uh, here. The Ethereum project uh, is the largest and best funded smart contract project in the world. And uh, there's their web address. I'd highly recommend going there and looking at some of their documentation. And actually, uh, Ethereum has developed a smart contract language called Solidity, 
and the Eris Industries Corporation has actually been kind enough to create a series of tutorials explaining how to use Stolidity and write your own smart contracts. So if you're interested in this and you actually want to start exploring how these things work in more detail, uh, there's a link to the very first tutorial, which in turn links to the other four. There's also a great book by Tim Swanson uh, called The Great Chain of Numbers or something like that. And there's the uh, web address to it, and I believe he's released it under a Creative Commons license. So I'd highly recommend reading it. Okay, well that's all I have to say about smart contracts. You can reach me on Twitter at IOHK underscore Charles. If you have any questions at all, feel free to send me a direct message or tweet to me. Um, or uh, leave me a comment in the YouTube. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, and uh, I hope this helps you understand a bit more about how smart contracts work and what they are, as well as perhaps why they can be useful.